Ever since it appeared deep in the oceans, 3.8 billion years ago, life has been evolving and diversifying, providing natural selection with endless options and strategies for survival. One of these strategies relies on the use of venom. It has become increasingly interesting to medical researchers. Venoms contain toxins, perfected over millennia, to radically affect the metabolisms of the prey into which they are injected. Their favorite targets are the prey's bloodstream, nervous system, or immune system. These molecules are precious models, or sources of inspiration for researchers trying to pierce the secret of their efficiency in order to use their specific properties for therapeutic purposes. But they have only just begun to explore this amazing well of ingenuity. There are approximately 200,000 species of venomous animals on Earth. That's 10% of the animal kingdom, which is huge. And we've only really studied the venoms of a few hundred animals. The venom of some terrestrial animals have been studied for a long time, but the wonderful diversity of the venoms produced by marine organisms has still hardly been researched. Nowadays, one of these animals is drawing the focus of all scientists because the active principle found in its venom has opened brand new doors for pharmaceutical research. Cone snails are sea snails a few inches long, found in the tropical and subtropical areas of the world. Safe inside their sturdy shells, they are able to blend into sandy bottoms. But they are actually fearsome carnivorous predators. Their success rests first and foremost on their chemical skills. This patient hunter spots its prey by smelling the molecules it gives off. The cone snail gets in range and launches out a thin tentacle that sneaks up on the desired fish. This tentacle, called a proboscis, ends with a tiny harpoon loaded with venom a true single-serving hypodermic syringe created 55 million years ago. The prey is instantly paralyzed and pulled into the monster's open mouth to be eaten alive. These snails have become masters of the art of producing extremely specific and efficient types of poison. It must be a significant asset, since now there are over 800 different species of cone snails, each one using a different method and venom.
Their diversity was what first sparked the interest of collectors, who admired the endless beauty and variety of the patterns of their shells. The Natural History Museum of Geneva owns one of the most interesting collections in the world. Yves Finet, the curator, has endless things to say about them. The cones are quite well known for their venomous properties. They are in fact predatory animals that feed on other living animals. The most famous is the geography cone. Why is it called that? Because its shell vaguely resembles an old geographic map. Here is a beautiful example of a textile cone. It is called that because of its decorations, which look a bit like a fabric. And here is the cone-shaped whorl. Here is the opening which the animal comes out of when it's alive, underwater. The main distinctions are whether they eat fish, the piscivores, sea worms, or either sea mollusks or even other cone snails. Approximately 50 years ago, no one had looked very closely at this discrete predator. The first scientist to study its specific abilities is from the Philippines. Toto Baldomera Oliveira is among the people that know cone snails best. As a child, he wandered over beaches already captivated by these strange creatures whose shells he collected. I uh, grew up in the Philippines, finished my college degree. And then I went to the U.S. for graduate studies. And I really worked uh, for my Ph.D. on DNA and genes. Uh, so at the beginning of molecular biology. Then I wanted to go back to the Philippines, so I accepted a job here. But I found out when I got here that I would not be able to pursue the work that I wanted because we had no equipment. I had a laboratory with no equipment at all. So I thought, uh, well, we should look for something to do. We should maybe find a project that we could do with no equipment, at least initially, and that maybe had some local advantages. The Philippines are comprised of over 7,000 islands, surrounded by coral reefs, where the opulence of biodiversity has not been diminished. The Pacific Ocean feeds most of the inhabitants of the Philippines, and it provided Toto Oliveira with his study subject. There is a lot of shellfish here, and the young penniless scientist saw an opportunity to combine work and passion. In the 1970s, Lourdes Cruz, a young researcher who had just graduated, joined him. Toto is aware, since he was a shell collector ever since he was nine years old, of the um, deadly cones, particularly Cones geographus, that has been uh, known by fishermen to kill people. The geography cone is one of the most dangerous species of cone snails. The original method of fishing it has developed relies on the great specificity of the toxins it can produce. Once it is close enough to its prey, it seems it releases into the water molecules that will plunge its victim into a kind of lethargy. The cone opens its mouth until it is wrapped all around its prey, and only then injects it with its lethal venom. The entire maneuver lasts no longer than a few seconds, leaving no doubt as to the efficiency of the active molecules in the venom. And when it feels threatened, it is also a weapon the cone will readily use to defend itself. The latest conscious thing that I encountered was a patient who was brought to the Philippine General Hospital maybe about 10 years ago. 
the victim was a construction worker. In the evening, he went to the sea to spear fish and try to catch uh, fish for his meals. And one time, after he speared a fish, he found a big uh -huh. cone snail, maybe bigger than this cone of geographers, crawling on the sea. And so right away, because they eat cone snails, he said, oh, what a big dinner I would have. What he did was to get it and put it under the elastic of his trunk because he was holding a fish in the spear. And of course, he got stung. And then after a while, he was feeling uneasy. He said he was getting a little dizzy, so he went up the boat. And then he felt he was getting paralyzed. Without immediate emergency medical attention, the geography cone sting can be lethal for humans. Ten minutes after being stung, the victim suffers from strong headaches and spells of dizziness before the numbness and the paralysis set in. Breathing becomes increasingly difficult, and the victim ends up asphyxiating. And as soon as they reached the hospital, he had respiratory arrest. Luckily, the doctor knew what to do and gave him right away artificial respiration, and so he was saved. It's really very bad, you know, in one and a half hours, if the doctor had not given him artificial respiration, he would have been dead. When Lourdes Cruz and Baldomero Oliveira began their research, the danger of the geography cone sting was well known to the locals. But the nature of the lethal ingredient in its venom, or the way it operated, had never been studied. We decided to try to find out what component of the venom can kill people. It took us a long time to answer that question, but uh, essentially what happened was that while we were pursuing that question, we discovered that the venoms were extremely complex, much more interesting than we ever thought. The venom of the geography cone happens to be a cocktail of several hundred very diverse ingredients that cause sequences of complex reactions in the organisms of their victims. The problem is that if you have the whole venom, it has 100 or 200 components, uh, and so you get a very complicated response, okay? And so to understand uh, what's going on, you have to separate all the components out, and that's, that's the real work. That's, that's where the science is important. It was a very difficult task. Isolating each active principle in a venom that contains over a hundred is like wanting to extract the ingredients of a particularly well-mixed cocktail, or wanting to isolate the components of a color. It was not impossible, but it was tedious work. Chemists have long since discovered chromatography, a process which allows them to do just that. It is very much like a series of races run by the molecules. All of them do not move with the same ease in this or that environment. Some molecules move more quickly in water, others in a lubricated environment. The results of these races take the form of a chart where each spike represents a different component. The height of the spike depends on the quantity of the ingredient in the analyzed substance. Once this process was done, Baldomera and Cruz tested the isolated toxins individually by injecting them into mice. There came their first surprise. The molecules found in the greatest quantity were not responsible for the paralysis. It was one summer when I was first trying to separate the components of conus We found several peaks 
the major peaks did not contain paralytic activity, but we found the uh, paralysis being caused by a very minor component. We could practically not see. We were very excited because that means that whatever little material there is must be very potent. The first active molecule extracted from the cone's venom happened to be a peptide, a small protein. Proteins are the basic units for building life. They are chains of amino acids directly produced by transcribing the DNA code. Depending on the nature, the amount, and the placement of the amino acids that make them up, these proteins have very different shapes and functions. For example, in the human body, there are hundreds of thousands of different kinds. They play a central part in most vital functions at the cellular level. The first peptide that was isolated acts very much like uh, the deadly toxins that you find in snakes related to cobras. Uh, and it turns out that this peptide acts in more or less the same way. So if I injected a little bit of this 13 amino acid peptide into this finger, it would become paralyzed. The particularity of the paralyzing peptide they isolated was that it was just as efficient, but a lot smaller than its equivalent in snakes. 74 amino acids for the snakes, only 13 for the cone snails, which makes it a lot easier to reproduce synthetically. But Baldomera identified a second ingredient with the same properties as a toxin of the pufferfish, the Japanese fugu, also known for inducing lethal paralysis. So uh, that answers why Conus jarophus is so deadly, uh, because in fact, when you get stung by this snail, it's like being bitten by a cobra and eating a lethal dose of pufferfish at the same time. The cone strategy does not rely on a single poison, but on a combination of molecules, each with a different mode of action. This unsuspected diversity prodded Baldomera into extending his research into other species of cone snails. But it was at first a disappointing foray. While the venoms of the striated, textile, and magical cones revealed a great variety of small, as yet unknown peptides, these peptides did not seem to cause any spectacular reactions once injected into the muscles of mice. Until the day the initiative of an American student changed the direction of the research. The big breakthrough in our work was there was a young student in Utah uh, whose name is Craig Clark. And he decided to take each of these components after they had been separated and to inject it directly into the central nervous system of a mouse. And when he did that, each component caused the mouse to do something different. And so there was one component that put mice to sleep, and then they'd wake up and they'd be perfectly fine. There was another peptide that made mice uh, very sluggish, uh, another peptide that really caused convulsions, another peptide that caused trembling, another peptide that caused scratching another peptide that made mice shake their heads. Craig Clark had brought into light a brand new hypothesis. What if most of these peptides acted on the nervous system? What if the paralysis they caused in fish was triggered by an upstream block of the muscles themselves, somewhere on the nervous circuit that dictated their action? Walking, running, or jumping are purposeful actions ordered by our brain. Our brain sends an electrical signal transmitted by the neurons, the cells of the nervous system, along fibers called axons. These axons end in synapses. The synapses transform this electrical message into a chemical message. The electrical impulse triggers the opening of tiny channels in the synapses, the calcium channels. By entering these channels, the calcium releases 
neural mediators that bind to the receptors on the muscle's motor plate, triggering its contraction and consequently movement. Baldomera's working hypothesis became that cone snails' peptides interfered somewhere on this circuit to block it. He gave each of his students a mission, to choose a peptide and reassess its action, this time on the nervous system. One of them, Michael McIntosh, chose a molecule extracted from the venom of the beautifully named magical cone and confirmed Clark's hypothesis. What I found was very interesting activity where when we introduced the compound into the brain of the animal, it produced a shaking symptom. So the mice would kind of have this fine tremor, so we called it the shaker toxin. It was really the first uh, demonstration that there were small compounds within the venom that could act in the nervous system and that began to give people ideas that there might be something that could be valuable as a medication. After synthesizing this molecule, Baldomero evidenced a very subtle mode of action. When the cone injects its venom, this small peptide binds to the receptors of the closest calcium channels, blocking them and stopping the transmission of nervous impulses to the muscles thus causing the paralysis, and maybe even the death of the fish. But there remained a crucial question. Why did this peptide, when injected into the muscle of a mouse, not trigger the same paralysis? The answer came from another team that was working on the transmission of nervous impulses. There are different kinds of calcium channels in the nervous system, and they do not all play the same part. Those the peptide targets in the fish are located around the muscles and take part in the transmission of motor information. But in mammals, they are located in the spine and take part in the transmission of pain. Baldomero found out that in the same way this molecule could paralyze fish, it could also block pain in mammals. This was the early 1980s. In order to fight the problems of chronic pain, from which one person out of six suffers, medicine's only solution was morphine derivatives and the downsides they come with. This peptide from the venom of the magical cone might be the first alternative to morphine and offer a brand new way to approach pain management. Dennis Church is in charge of convincing the pharmaceutical industry to finance the years of clinical testing necessary to transform new molecules into a drug approved by the health authorities. Clearly, what one doesn't want to redevelop a product that already exists. So I would say that the main driver is really meeting an unmet medical need. It's really thinking of the patient. Uh, that's, that's what drives it. So for example, a, a new treatment uh, for a disease for which there is no treatment, that would be of interest. Or for example, a new product uh, which has lesser side effects. Then I would say that uh, probably the second thing to consider is the ability to actually uh, progress that molecule into clinical development and uh, onto the market with pharmaceutical sponsor. So things like, uh, is the scientist able to produce enough of it? Uh, can they have access to enough of it? Uh, do they have access to uh, the, the capability of doing the experiments that are required for developing the molecule in preclinical development and bring it into the clinic? And uh, thirdly, is the scientist convinced ahead of time that in following all of these steps, would that result in a compelling product which is differentiated from other products that are already on the market for use uh, in that disease, or uh, is more compelling than things that are also being developed by others. There could be no doubt about the potential of this peptide. A Californian startup gathered the necessary means. Clinical tests came back positive. 
and after over 30 years of research, a medicine called Prealt was released as the first alternative to morphine in 2005. Part of the scientific community was highly enthusiastic. To that day, only five medicines had been derived from venoms. One to treat hypertension, three for problems of blood coagulation, and one against diabetes. But none of them were based on peptides acting on the nervous system. And none of them came from a marine organism. Prealt launched the study of venoms into a new direction, the use of their active molecules in pain management. Prealt was the first marine toxin, even marine molecule, that was developed as a drug. It's pioneered the idea that you can find a peptide and once you know where its target is, um, use it um, to selectively treat pain that can't normally be treated. And Prealt was really the forerunner of this. It's the first one and it paved the way, I guess, to the opportunities of venom peptides as therapeutics. However, this first medicine might have been original in its approach, but it still had many flaws that limited its use. The natural toxins of the cone snail are intended to be injected close to their targets. Their structure does not allow them to cross the wall of the intestine. That means they cannot be administered orally. In order to block pain, they must be injected epidurally straight into the spine with an implanted micropump. Furthermore, Prealt has important side effects. The peptide also seems to act on other channels whose function we do not understand well yet. It is consequently only used in cases when morphine has become ineffective. But this first medicine has given research new momentum. There are over 800 species of cone snails, and their venoms, which contain hundreds of components, are different from one to the next. In Australia, where other venomous animals are plentiful, researchers are still convinced of the exceptional potential of conotoxins. Yeah, in Australia, we're embarrassed with riches in terms of venoms. We have the most dangerous snakes, we have the most dangerous spiders, we have um, interesting scorpions, and not in this case the most deadly. We have uh, jellyfish that are most deadly in the world, stonefish that are the most deadly fish in the world. So the reason we chose the conotoxins was that they have some of the smallest peptides and they also have some of the most diverse venoms. So the chemistry is really amazingly diverse. And because they're small, we can make them synthetically quite easily. So it means we can accelerate the discovery of new bioactives. In Brisbane, David Craig and Richard Lewis from the University of Queensland chose to take over from Valdemera Oliveira and Lourdes Cruz by eliminating the two main flaws of Prealt. They thought that they could identify in these venoms other compounds affecting pain transmission, but with a more targeted effect and consequently fewer side effects. Well, we're working with conotoxins because they're very, very specific for ion channels and, and receptors that are involved in a number of physiological processes associated with, with pain. And we work with them in particular because they target those receptors very, very specifically. Peptides owe the specificity that makes them so therapeutically interesting to their shape. Just like in a child's puzzle, only the pieces with the right shape can fit into any given location. It is the same for the peptides and the receptors they target, like, for example, those of the calcium channels of the pain circuit. However, some shapes can fit into several locations. They end up throwing off other circuits and causing side effects. When a new peptide liable to affect pain was isolated, Craig started studying its molecular structure. No microscope is powerful enough to make out these tiny objects. But by using nuclear magnetic resonance, Craig managed to identify the amino acids of the peptide and put together a 3D image of the molecule. So basically what we do is we discover the natural peptide sequence from the cone snail and that's typically just a, a chain of amino acids of maybe 16 to 30 amino acids in size. Um, so one amino acid joined to the next to the next 
and then it folds into a complex three-dimensional shape, a little bit like this model here. So this shape is determined by the sequence of amino acids in the, in the peptide. According to David Craig, this shape could also be the cause of the other problem of natural conotoxins, their inability to cross the wall of the intestine, which prevents them from being administered orally. What we're showing here is the three-dimensional structure of a conotoxin molecule that we uh, derived using NMR spectroscopy. So often what we do is simplify that down by not displaying all of the atoms, we simplify it down so that we just look at the backbone, so that the overall shape. And you can see for this conotoxin, it has this little helical shape here. And it's this helix that interacts with the receptor, um, the target of, the, of this conotoxin molecule. But the problem with the naturally occurring molecule is that it has two ends. How is the presence of these two open-ended extremities a problem? David Craig managed to answer that question by looking back at research on peptides led almost 50 years ago by a Norwegian doctor. A Norwegian doctor went to the Congo in the 1960s and um, he noticed that in the local hospitals women would give birth very quickly when they started to go into labour and he found that what they were doing is, is making a tea from a local plant boil the, the, the leaves of the plant in water and then sip the tea and that would have an effect to make the uterus contract and, and the babies would be born very rapidly. Um, so he, he took some of this plant back to Norway and found that the active ingredient was a peptide of around 30 amino acids but he, he couldn't characterise exactly the structure. And then 20 years later we, we got hold of some of this peptide and found that the structure was unusual in that the, the chain of amino acids was actually joined head to tail like a snake sort of biting its tail. Um, that gave us the clue as to why this protein could be boiled. Because the ends are usually the weak points of proteins, the places where enzymes chew away, um, if you don't have an end then there's no weak point for, for being um, broken down. This discovery determined the direction of Craig's research. Since a closed-off peptide could withstand the enzymes of gastric juices better, he was going to try to modify the structure of the molecule accordingly. A lot of our drugs today come from nature, probably about half. And many of these are actually exactly as, as nature produced them. But many of them had to be modified. So while they targeted um, a pathway or a specific receptor, they might not have done it selectively enough, or they may not have stayed in the body long enough to be a good drug. And in these cases, people have had to modify them, usually only slightly. Modifying molecules remains, to this day, a delicate exercise that requires a high degree of precision. But Craig managed to add a few extra amino acids to the natural peptide extracted from the cone snails' venom, which closed it off. You can see that this is a continuous chain of peptide backbone. It has no ends and therefore can't be broken down by digestive enzymes, but still has the helix that's important for biological activity. He hopes to have created a descendant of prealt that could be swallowed instead of injected. A few more years will be necessary before we can tell if this new molecule is everything he was hoping for. So basically, um, the drug design process is a very long and expensive process. People typically estimate these days that it can cost as much as 800 million US dollars and 12 to 15 years to take a new drug from conception of the idea right through to the market. Turn a venom peptide into a drug is actually, it's a challenge. And the idea is to identify molecules, usually in animal models, that have got potential as therapeutics based on their ability to reduce responses in animals that are related to a clinical syndrome like pain. Then we take it through a series of steps that look at its safety as well as its efficacy and once we're convinced that it is safe enough to put into healthy people we can then inject that into people or have people take it orally and get the very first evidence that in fact it is safe and doesn't produce unwanted side effects. 
Once we get that evidence, then we can take it through phase two trials, which look at safety and efficacy, and eventually through much larger trials of usually 800 to even more than 1,000 people, where we test for safety and efficacy in a large population of people. So the thing to realize is that um, most molecules don't actually make it ever to market. Uh, the chance of a novel molecule uh, being of therapeutic use is approximately one in about 400. When they assessed the economical weight of these uncertainties, about 20 European laboratories united for a very ambitious project aiming to systematize the exploration of the potential of cone snails' as venoms. The idea was to use the most recent tools in genetics and bioinformatics in order to analyze all the peptides produced by a species of cone snail and to test their action on a wide range of targets. This project, called CONCO, is coordinated by Swiss biochemist Reto Stocklin. CONCO is a project of molecular exploration which, instead of focusing on a condition or on a biological system, on a molecular target, is focused on an organism, the cone snail, a venomous sea snail, and on analyzing it down to the last molecule, on exploring every molecule of its venom, and even more, since we're interested in other molecules it can synthesize. Their goal is to reach with both hands into the biochemical treasure chest that are these venoms, and to test all the keys it contains in the hopes that some will open locks they did not know about. Locks that will help them cure conditions that are for now untreatable. The members of Reto Stockland's team headed to the Chesterfield Islands, off of New Caledonia, to pick up the specimens they needed to launch their project. These wild islands, undisturbed by human presence, are the shelter for a great many birds and crustaceans. Their only visitors are a few turtles looking for somewhere quiet to lay their eggs. Here in the heart of the Coral Sea, marine life is still exceptionally diverse. The animal on which the team has chosen to focus their efforts is the singed cone. Like the geography cone, it possesses a fearsome venomous harpoon. At nightfall, the cone starts hunting for small fish for dinner. It is the best moment for the divers to encounter it. But the other great asset of the cone snails is their discretion. The mission was eventually successful, but a great many dives were necessary to gather the few cone snails required for the project. The precious specimens were flown back to Geneva where everybody's attention focused on them. Out of a desire to preserve the rich diversity of these master chemists for future generations, the project has every intention of keeping these subjects in aquariums in order to observe them and try to make them reproduce. For the same reason, dissection is not a viable option. 
an original method was used to obtain the amount of venom necessary for their analyses. Decent bait, some patience, good reflexes, and a little practice were enough to trick the animal putting its harpoon into a test tube right when it attacked its prey. This technique was as simple as it was efficient. But each time, in order to keep its spirits up, the frustrated predator received a well-deserved reward. The first stage of the project could begin. The different technologies of modern molecular biology were called upon to make a list of all the peptides the singed cone could synthesize. not only by isolating all the ones in its venom, but also by reaching into the heart of its genome for the sequences of code leading to their production. The researchers were also hoping to pierce the secrets of the metabolic mechanisms, thanks to which this snail is able to synthesize so many highly sophisticated molecules. and the unique combination of each peptide finds its sources in the DNA of the cone snails. Small portions of this vast code direct the order and production of the amino acids that once combined will become a specific component of the venom. For the first time, a venomous marine organism has had its genome sequenced in order to discover new molecules and active principles. After long months of research, in about 20 laboratories, the different approaches yielded their results. The scientists of CONCO had a list of the thousands of components the singed cone could produce. In order to make a first selection in this gigantic mass of information, they could rely on an ally the Filipinos did not have 40 years earlier, bioinformatics. Networking the databases on the cone snails' venoms allowed them to quickly eliminate the already identified peptides, or to liken an as of yet unknown molecule to an already studied one, giving the scientists hints on potential targets. But once this first selection was done, the only way forward was laboratory testing. The selected molecular candidates were isolated or synthesized, then sent off to a dozen European laboratories, including the National Center for Scientific Research in gif sur near Paris, so they could try to spot the type of action these new peptides had on living cells. These are the peptides Atheris sent us. It's great. We get to test them on African clawed frog's eggs. Clawed frogs are African amphibians that produce a large amount of eggs. These eggs possess characteristics very close to human cells. By testing the molecules on these eggs, the researchers would be able to detect if these molecules were liable to be medically interesting. We focused on pain management, but also on conditions like Alzheimer's, diabetes, or cancer. We kept a very open mind and tried to go beyond what had been done until that point. During five years, the laboratories of the CONCO project submitted the host of new peptides provided by singed cones to bioassays. but the results did not meet people's expectations, only yielding one potential painkiller and other such molecules that had already been discovered. Yet Reto Stocklin was convinced that the singed cones' venom held more treasures, that there had to be among these molecules perfected over billions of years a previously unknown biological tool, a key that would unlock new ways to affect the subtle mechanisms of our bodies. When we designed the project CONCO 
When we came up with the CONCO project seven, eight years ago, our objective was obviously to find a certain number of things we were confident we would find in a snail's venom, like molecules for pain management. It was great to find some, but we were quite confident that we would. For me, the big challenge was to find unexpected things, to open doors to new research subjects, to make what I would call a real discovery, something nobody had ever seen before, something that would open new avenues for us. A few months before the planned end of the project, during a meeting about the original structure of a family of peptides that intrigued the researchers, an unexpected lead finally came to light. It isn't something that was discovered via bioassay. It's something that was discovered thanks to computer tools and thanks to the vision and knowledge of a few experts in that subject who pinpointed it during a meeting. We as a group were looking at sequences on the screen and we suddenly stopped on these. So we pulled them out of the database, we synthesized them, and we made these synthetic molecules fluorescent so that they would stand out. And we incubated them with cultures of cells by checking whether the fluorescence made it inside the cell or not. We were able to realize that some of these peptides did have the ability to enter the cells without damaging them, but only certain types of cells. These peptides are called CPPs, for cell-penetrating peptides. For Dr. Mata Darawazi, a cancer research specialist at the University Hospital of Geneva, they provide brand new opportunities. Picture the CPP as a train. The CPP is a locomotive with several wagons. The CPP has the unique property of being able to take these wagons through a cell's membrane. You can put different things into these wagons. You could put a protein in there, or some DNA, but also small molecules. It's logical for the venoms to have this type of molecule since the venom contains toxins that must reach their targets. And these targets are sometimes inside cells. So the venom also contains molecules able to open doors to open the way for other molecules to take them where they're supposed to go. Among these molecules, some show a behavior that revealed their extraordinary potential they are preferentially attracted to different types of cancer cells. Current chemotherapies have such devastating side effects because they destroy the healthy cells at the same time as the targeted cancer cells. So by transporting the chemotherapeutic agent more efficiently to the cancer cells, the treatment will be more efficient and the side effects less pronounced, since the chemotherapeutic agent will be less likely to end up in healthy cells. The systematic study of the singed cones venom has opened a new avenue of research focused on a family of molecules that might be able to truly improve the efficiency of current chemotherapies against some cancers. We were lucky. There was, as usual, some random luck. There were some hypotheses, no doubt some good scientists, and we came through. We managed to discover something new, and we hope that many research groups will study it further. Research often progresses thanks to a discovery that sheds light on a new field of investigation. Then people read an article or hear a paper at a conference, and they decide to study that area. I like to call that research in the spotlight. But when you do research in the spotlight, you forget about the gray area all around it. One of the objectives of CONCO was to turn on a new spotlight aimed at a gray area. I think that we managed to maybe bring up a new scientific thematic. We turned on a new powerful spotlight. A new spotlight is on 
that the gray area surrounding the cone snails' venoms remains gigantic. The new leads they have offered us concerning pain management or cancer treatment are incredible advances, but the vast stock of active molecules in their venoms selfishly retains its secrets. This is yet another proof of the importance of preserving the incredible wealth of biodiversity, since all of life has evolved from common elements. At the heart of the cells of the simplest organisms, evolution has triggered the development of a great many original processes, only some of which we understand to this day. Some may hold the keys that would allow us to treat conditions against which we can, for now, do nothing. Preserving this diversity is also giving our own species the best chance of survival.